Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this program today, we'll be discussing why it's so important to stand with the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Warm welcome to the programme. And my guest today is all the way from Israel. Her name is uh, Sandra Boris. She is the Director of Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. Uh, Sandra, welcome back to the Middle East Report. It almost seems like an annual event, so it's great it to have is, you on the yes. programme. Uh, and I know that you've just been to uh, Jersey That's to speak right. with uh, Jersey Friends of Israel. And I want to make a special uh, thank you to Alan Ferguson uh, for sending me this nice I Support Israel uh, Jersey uh, little little uh, bracelet there, so thank you very much for that. And um, how, was, how was your time in the UK talking about the significance of the Jewish communities in, the, in Judea and Samaria, known as the biblical heartland of Israel? Well, it's been good. I mean, as always, I travel and speak to audiences who are already pro-Israel. The ones who don't like Israel don't usually invite me to speak. But, uh, it, and, and that's why, by the way, it's so important, I feel, every time I come here, to be here on Revelation TV, because this really is an opportunity for me and to, for our messages to reach out way beyond uh, people who I may know personally, who may be personally interested in Judea and Samaria. They may turn on the Middle East Report because they want to know what's going on then we have an opportunity to influence, and that's great. So thank you, Simon, for having me on the that's program. That's a pleasure. Uh, and, and can you share with us, uh, Sandra, some of the activities that you've been involved in since you were lost on the program a year ago, and the nature of the work of uh, uh, Christian Friends of Israeli Communities? Well, we actually just celebrated 20 years since we got started. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, when we got started, you know, this idea of a Christian-Jewish partnership for Israel, and particularly for Judea and Samaria, was almost unheard of. Certainly in the Jewish world in Israel, the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria had almost no awareness of the fact that they had this huge group of potential supporters in the Christian world around the world. Um, and today, of course, everything is, is so different, and I'm really excited that I've been a part of that. Uh, from the beginning, our goal was to reach out to Christians who have this understanding of Israel from a biblical, from a biblical perspective and enable them to understand uh, what the Jewish communities are in Judea and Samaria. Because what they're seeing in the media, as you will, except for this media outlet, is uh, occupied territories, Palestine, we're taking land that doesn't belong to us. Uh, but we know that that's not the case. We know that for us as Jews, we've come back to our own land, that uh, it's been a miraculous journey. God has opened the doors for us and just beckoned us to come in and, and settle that land in fulfillment of prophecy. And this is how Jews have seen their relationship with Israel for centuries. And this is how we today in, in modern Israel see our relationship to the land and our responsibility to the land. Uh, the land of Israel is a place where the exiles have come back and, and restored the land. Well, where better to restore Jewish living in Israel than in the heart of biblical Israel, in places like Hebron and, and, and uh, Tekoa, and uh, you know, places where uh, Elkanah, the father of Samuel, wandered as he made his way to Shiloh, uh, to the tabernacle. And these are the places where we've settled. This is Judea and Samaria. So bringing that message to Christians has really been our mandate for 20 years. And then as a corollary of that, enabling Christians not just to hear the message and say, yay, you know, uh, or hallelujah, but to actually do something, get involved. And so we are enabling Christians to get involved directly in what's going on in Judea and Samaria. Fantastic. So let's have a look at this uh, excellent promotional video of the work of uh, Christian friends of Israeli communities. <laughs> Christian Friends of Israeli Communities. Who are they?
Christian Friends of Israeli Communities, also known as CFOIC Heartland, was established in 1995 as a Christian response to the 1993 Oslo Peace Accords. Christians around the world were concerned about Israel's territorial concessions and wanted a way to support the Jewish people in the biblical heartland, Judea and Samaria. CFOIC Heartland has three purposes. One, educate, two, visit, and three, support. To educate Christians about the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria. Help Christians visit these communities in Judea and Samaria. To provide an avenue for Christians to financially support vital community needs in Judea and Samaria. Since the beginning, CFOIC Heartland has stood with the Jews who are at greatest risk in Israel. Now that you know who CFOIC Heartland is, you can join our family today. By getting updates from Israel. Or by leading or joining a tour. Or by making a donation. We'd love to meet you. Join the CFYC Heartland family. And that gives you a, a little bit of an understanding of the important work uh, that uh, Sonja and her team are doing in telling the truth about the uh, Jewish settlers living in the biblical heartland of Israel. Um, I have to ask you, um, Sonja, why is Christian support so vital? Um, is it because of the constant assault on your communities by the mainstream media of the world, by the pol politicians, by, by the EU, by our own foreign office uh, and what have you, who don't understand the true realities on the ground? Absolutely. I, if you think about it for a moment, everything that targets every body, every entity, every person, every politician that targets Israel for some sort of condemnation focuses on the Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria, what is often referred to as settlements. And um, this has become the scapegoat, as it were, for anything uh, you know, bad about Israel. This is, this is what becomes what Israel represents. And it is presented in a completely slanted, completely false, completely negative view. Now, if we look at the situation, how do you combat that? Now, I can go and talk to people who hate Israel. I can talk until I'm blue in the face. I will get absolutely nowhere. I can try talking to people who are neutral about Israel, but it's going to be very hard for me to convince them that what they're seeing night after night on the evening news is false, because to them, these are authorities. When I go to Christians, I have a value that we share. I have a holy book that we share. So we're starting out with something that if I make reference to that and I explain why we're doing what we're doing, uh, grounded in the Bible, God, grounded in God's word, I don't have to convince them to believe me. The Bible convinces them to believe Absolutely. me. Yes. And so that already creates a basis for, for support with a group that is much easier to win them over to our side, as it were. Um, then go beyond that. There are a lot of Christians in this world. There aren't too many Jews, you know. But Christians are in large numbers, and particularly in the United States, where Christians have, are not only um, have large in numbers, but large and growing in political influence. So it's both a value-based alliance, but it's also, I think, an alliance with tremendous political um, you know, ramifications that are good for Israel. Absolutely. Uh, and, um, and yet the international community says that your communities, which I think are so important and integral part of Israel, because you are literally living in the biblical heartland of Israel, where the Old Testament comes alive, the Tanakh. Um, and yet there is nothing but hatred and condemnation by the international community saying that you uh, represent the biggest obstacle to peace between a settlement between the Israelis and, and the Palestinians. Uh, uh, and yet, when you actually visit the communities, uh, like I did with uh, Afrat last October, you see even there with the Jewish communities, there's cooperation with the local Palestinian villages. Um, why doesn't the mainstream media pick up on this fact? Well, they know about it, but it just, you know, it, it takes away from the, 
message that they're trying to convey. I mean, you know, the old saying, you know, don't confuse me with facts, you know, and that's exactly what we're witnessing today. Um, actually, I'm very excited that you visited Efrat. Uh, my son and daughter-in-law and my little grandson live there, <laughs> and uh, they are moving into their new house, which they have just completed building in Efrat, thanks to growing uh, building permits that are, have been released for building in the last few years. So. And also, I think it's important to, to mention the fact as well that your communities are actually built almost up on the hill lands. That's right. Where there isn't any housing, you know, the local Palestinian small little town or village is absolutely miles away. Uh, and otherwise, this space wouldn't be used for anything. Well, what happened is the uh, Arabs, uh, through the centuries, when, when they lived in these areas, and frankly, it's also important to note that very few Arabs lived in that land either until the 20th century. And it was the Jews coming back, it was the British coming into the land that created economic opportunities. So when you see Arabs on television, Palestinians saying, oh, we've been here for centuries, well, they haven't. Or most of them haven't. Because you look at photographs from 1920, right? Places that today are very crowded are really empty. So that's one thing. But the Jewish communities have all been built on public land, which means land that doesn't belong to any Arabs, doesn't, has not been cultivated by Arabs, because even if an Arab didn't own a piece of land, couldn't show title deed to a land, but in fact has agriculture growing there and, and he's been tending his olive trees or whatever, we wouldn't touch that land. Now, naturally, when the Arabs sought to live or uh, grow things, they went to the easier places in the valleys uh, where water is more um, abundant, where the land is a bit flatter, not so rocky, and the rocky hilltops were abandoned by them, never paid attention, which was very good for us because those rocky hilltops, first of all, we're coming in to build communities. We have big bulldozers, you know, we can dig through the rock, lay, lay down the foundations and build homes, stores, schools, whatever. But also, most of our communities are in our farming communities, so we don't need that kind of, of land, you know, flat or whatever. But the other thing is, that's the strategic high ground. Absolutely. And with, you know, let's, we can't ignore the very unpleasant realities that there's a lot of terrorism in our area. So for us to be on the high ground gives us certainly an advantage. Um, there's no question that we would like, we seek to live with our Arab neighbors in peace. And there is quite an um, extensive level of coexistence and cooperation between Jews and Arabs in Judea and Samaria. There was even more so uh, before uh, the first intifada began, which was began in early '88, and uh, then, of course, in even greater uh, intensity once the Palestinian Authority was created. But a lot of the people, a lot of the Arabs who live there, they just want a good life. And when they come to work in Israel, or when they come to work in the communities, which you see quite a lot of, all the homes that have been built in Judea and Samaria um, are built by Arabs, almost all of them. They're making between four and five times a salary what they would make if they were working for a Palestinian business. So when the governments around the world pressure Israel to freeze the building in Judea and Samaria, who is damaged first? The Palestinians who lose their jobs because we're not building. You know, so these are the kinds of things that are going on um, on the ground. But unfortunately, the Palestinian leadership themselves are really not interested in the welfare of the Palestinian Arabs. They're interested in bashing Israel and in gaining uh, PR for their efforts to delegitimize Israel, even if that comes at the expense of the Arabs themselves. And also, I think it's important to, to mention the fact that um, the whole idea and the concept behind the Palestinian Authority's vision is to have a future Palestinian state that is Juden-free. In other words, no Jews in that territory whatsoever. So how, in this age of sensitivity towards racism, can you then say, no, we don't want any Jews living in, the, in their land, which is their biblical heritage and their biblical right? It, it just shows how crazy the world that we're living in, how our values are so upside down. No, absolutely. I mean, it goes back, I think, to um, what well, we can say this whole attitude is rooted in classic anti-Semitism. 
But I think one of the, mo the earliest um, expressions of that was in 1975, when the United Nations voted that Zionism was racism. Now, all over the world, national movements were coming up and throwing off the yoke of colonialism and establishing themselves as uh, autonomous, independent people in their original homeland, and that was considered good. When Israel, through Zionism, does the very same thing, reestablishing re ourselves as an independent nation on our historic land, we're considered racist. And ever since then, we have that kind of completely different treatment of Jews. When we are proud of who we are, we're racists, we're Nazis. Um, but Arabs can do whatever they want, and they're considered, you know, uh, fighting for their uh, national birthright or whatever. Let's have a look at uh, this excellent video produced by the uh, by Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, entitled uh, "The Judean Samaria Is Not Occupied Palestinian Territories." My guest is Ambassador Alan Baker, international law expert and former Israeli ambassador to Canada. Ambassador Baker, welcome. Thank you very much. Why does Israel insist that it is not a foreign occupying power, but has the distinct rights to the territory? International law defines occupation as one power occupying the lands of a foreign sovereign. In Israel's case, Israel is not occupying any foreign sovereign's lands. Israel entered the area in 1967 and took over the authority to administer the land from Jordan. And Jordan was never considered to be a sovereign in the area. In actual fact, uh, um, Israel and the Jewish people have got claims that, that go far back into uh, history and anybody who really uh, uh, reads the Bible can appreciate the fact that there are very solid historic and legal uh, bases to the claim of Israel with respect to the territories. And therefore Israel considers the territories not to be occupied, not to be Palestinian, but they're in dispute. We appreciate that the Palestinians also have claims with respect to the territory. Israel considers that its claims are far better based and uh, better uh, documented than any other claims. But Israel is committed to conduct negotiations with the Palestinians in order to find a, a permanent settlement to the issue. The Jordanians who, who basically occupied the territory after the, uh, the 1948 war, um, annexed it. But this annexation was never really recognized or acknowledged by the international community. Um, at a later stage, the King of Jordan voluntarily gave up any Jordanian sovereignty or claim to the territories to the Palestinian people. And so the, the Jordanians came and went, and the issue remained an issue between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Why does the international community then constantly refer to uh, the Palestinian territories? This is a complete fallacy, and, and it has absolutely no legal or political basis. There's never been a Palestinian state as such, and therefore the territories have never belonged to any Palestinian entity. There's no international agreement, there's no contract, there's no treaty, and there's no binding international resolution that determines that the territories belong to the Palestinians. But in actual fact, even the Palestinians themselves, in the agreements that they've signed with Israel, have acknowledged the fact that the ultimate permanent status of the territory is to be determined by negotiations. Therefore, even the Palestinians accept the fact that this is not Palestinian territory, it's disputed territory that has yet to be settled. If the local population own land, then uh, an administering power isn't allowed to take the land or use it. But if the land is not private, the administering power can use the land and enjoy the fruits of the land for as long as the area hasn't been finally determined with respect to its sovereignty. And so Israel justifiably can use land, which is not private land, which is public land, for establishing settlements, as long as these settlements don't take away 
the private rights of the local population. And therefore, in our opinion, uh, settlements are not Ill illegitimate. There's one other point. The issue of settlements is a negotiating issue. The Palestinians have agreed with the Israelis that the issue of settlements is one of the issues on the permanent status negotiating table. And therefore, anybody that comes along and claims that Israel's settlements are illegitimate, whether it's the EU, whether it's individual governments, whether it's the Secretary of State of the United States who said so specifically, or the spokesman of the State Department, they're prejudging a negotiating issue which, which is clearly incompatible with, with any uh, uh, negotiating uh, principle. These are issues that have to be negotiated between Israel and the Palestinians. Therefore, nobody can claim that they're illegitimate and nobody can claim that, that, that they're illegal as such. They have to be negotiated between the parties. There's no such thing as 1967 borders. A border is a, a line between two sovereign entities. Uh, in 1967, there was a ceasefire line that had existed since the 1948, 1947, 1948 war between the Arab states and Israel, when after Israel declared its independence. The Jordanians insisted on inserting in the armistice agreement of 1949 a provision which says that the armistice demarcation line is not a final border. Only Final borders can only be determined in peace negotiations between the parties. So the, the term 1967 borders is, is a non-existent term and anybody using this term, again, including the, the, the US administration and the EU, are simply being misled. We need our own uh, British Foreign Office to watch uh, that short interview to understand exactly the legal framework for the Jewish communities in the Shomron or Judean Samaria. Um, that was a great, uh, I, I'm a big fan of uh, Ambassador Alan uh, Baker. I think he's done a tremendous job there in actually conveying the truth and the legal situation facing your communities. Um, but the big question I want to ask is how has life changed for you, Sandra, and the brave and courageous Jewish communities living in Judea and Samaria um, under President Trump? Because we know that uh, President Obama and his administration had an absolute obsession uh, in trying with the Jewish settlers in, in terms of demonizing them and saying they were the biggest obstacle to peace, including a number of different UN resolutions that they pushed through. Well, I remember shortly after he became president, uh, one of the first statements that Trump made having to do with Israel, when having to address the issue of this two-state solution, he basically said, well, you know, a two-state solution is an option provided both parties want it. And that was music to our ears because we had been saying all along, why you keep pushing this two-state solution, it doesn't work. We, um, of course, I was against it from the beginning because I think this is all Israel. But if you look at it from a purely objective, practical point of view, since Israel has been transferring territory to the Palestinians, uh, either in bits and pieces under the Oslo process, and more, you know, significantly, completely withdrawing from Gaza in 2005, all we've received in return has been more terrorism. So if you keep trying something or keep moving in a particular direction and it fails, at one point you've got to sit back and say, this isn't working, let's look at something else. Now we, the people in Judea and Samaria, have many other suggestions. Suggestions that can uh, range from some sort of an autonomy uh, for the Palestinians, which is very similar to the situation today, uh, perhaps even annexation. Naftali Bennett has a, a proposal to begin with annexing Area C, the area where all the Jewish communities are located, which would mean bringing about not more than 100,000 Arabs uh, into Israel, making them or giving them the opportunity to become Israeli citizens. All these are wonderful proposals that nobody has ever been willing to entertain. And now for the first time, we feel like we have an ear in the United States and we have President, Vice President Pence, uh, many congressmen and senators who for the first time are willing to listen and entertain other suggestions. That in and of itself is an amazing accomplishment.
And uh, the uh, State Department, US State Department, has always predominantly been very, very hostile towards uh, your communities. But um, uh, in a recent report on human rights they produced in April, they actually referred to um, the West Bank for the first time, rather than the usual occupied Palestinian territories. Uh, what do you make of this term or term of difference that they've uh, Well, it's certainly changed. an improvement. I would rather they say Judea and Samaria because that's going back to its origins. But certainly West Bank is something that the State Department would view as far more neutral than occupied Palestinian territories, which as we've just heard from Professor Baker, uh, this is absolutely false, certainly prejudices the conversation by giving credence to Palestinian claims without you know, giving any credit for uh, Israeli claims, legal claims that are completely and totally legitimate. Uh, so that's certainly a, a a big improvement. I think Pompeo is an a, amazing improvement over what we have seen before. Uh, the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem is something that cannot be, uh, you know, downplayed in any way. It is an amazing accomplishment. Uh, I was actually invited to a reception in Jerusalem in the home of, of an Israeli uh, where we, th there was, uh, it was actually hosted or, or organized by the leaders of Judea and Samaria. Uh, there were mayors there, there were members of Knesset who were from Judea and Samaria. I was there and a number of other activists. Uh, and th there were also a number of American Christian leaders who were there uh, at that uh, uh, ceremony. And first of all, the fact that they came all the way from the United States to be part of this opening of the embassy also spoke volumes because it was so exciting to them. Um, but also, going back to what we discussed earlier, the importance of Christian support, one of the people there, one of the Christian leaders told me that they had a personal meeting with Trump just before he got elected. And one of the last things they said as they left the meeting was, move that embassy to Jerusalem. And so what we're seeing here in the Trump administration at the highest levels are dialogue going on between Christians and others who are the greatest supporters of Israel in the United States and the administration and moving things forward, changing the atmosphere, changing policies. Um, thank God. That's all I can say. Thank God. It's an amazing development. Absolutely. And also what's so interesting as well is now that the, uh, the Palestinian Authority have only got Europe to turn to. Um, they pretty much had Obama and his administration in their pockets, would do anything that uh, they wanted him to do, he would end up doing, particularly in damning UN resolutions like Resolution 2334, um, and constant condemnation of Israel by the State Department. But, but now we're seeing the balls on the other foot, and uh, the only way that they're going to continue receiving huge donations from the United States is if the Palestinian Authority actually carry out real reform and start governing interests in their own, within the interests of their own people, rather than their own selfish engrandizement that we're seeing within the Palestinian Authority. And I think that the Palestinian Authority are playing their cards completely wrong. I mean, for us, for it's good for us, I think. But they're refusing to talk to the Americans. Now, you can like the Americans, you can hate the Americans, but you can't ignore the Americans. And Trump, um, this one thing about him, he is not uh, running a popularity contest. He knows what he wants to accomplish, and he is not going to like, and he doesn't like if someone's not going to be willing to talk to him. So they're really putting their foot in it, uh, and hopefully this will be something that will only bring uh, Israel and the United States closer than ever before, and I'm hoping that that will be the case. Uh, and Sandra, can you tell us what is the problem with, um, with NGOs, uh, non-governmental organisations, particularly the likes of Oxfam, Amnesty International, mm. Christian Aid and others, who are making peace and reconciliation between the Israelis and the Palestinians more difficult by constantly taking the Palestinian position? Well, these organizations, I think, are, it's a misnomer. They are not there looking out for human rights. They're not there trying to promote peace. They have a very definite agenda, and their agenda is to destroy Israel as a Jewish state. And they are siding with the Palestinians under the guise of human rights. But what they're actually looking for is to um, advance a very anti-Zionist, anti-Jewish agenda. Um, Unfortunately, 
the Palestinians in recent uh, years have understood that their best way to achieve support and, um, and agreement with their policies is to couch what they're doing in terms of human rights. And this has been the link between these organizations and the Palestinian cause. But if you strip away the layers, what you see is none of these people are interested in the Palestinians, all they're interested in their agenda. And one of the best proofs of this was given to me not long ago uh, by a fellow named Bassam Eid, who is a Palestinian human rights activist. And before the Oslo process began and the Palestinian Authority uh, came to play, he was a very big advocate for Palestinian rights and he linked up with a lot of these organizations in um, combating what he saw as abuses of Palestinian uh, civil rights. Then the Palestinian Authority came in and became far greater abusers of Palestinian civil rights of anyone that had ever been in the area before. He goes back to the very same organizations and he says, I want you to help me in protecting the civil rights of the Palestinians vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Palestinian Authority. And they said, no, we're not interested. We are only interested in bashing Israel. And he told that to me personally when I met him in Jerusalem a few months ago. I want to show you now this uh, shocking uh, Hamas propaganda video. Uh, actually, it's produced by Oxfam. Uh, and let's have a look at uh, how biased uh, this video actually is. My name is Ali Dali, a أبوي كان يشتغل لجوبة في شركات في إسرائيل كانت بتشتغل معه سكر من جرى بعد ما سكر ال سكرت الحدود علينا في الاحتلال وبطلت تأخذ بضائع من غزة يعني كان ممكن اليوم تأكل بكرة ما تأكلش عنا في غزة هذا ما خلنا نكمل كمال للتوجيه وللجامعة من صغرنا بعشق الدراجة الدراجة هذه كانت مسابة خيال الروح يعني وين مروح معايا وين ما أمشي معايا مستقبلها مستقبل كل شيء أنا شاركت في المسيرة عشان حتى لا مطالب في حقوقنا حقق لا كلاعب درجات لاعب منتخب فلسطين نطلع بار ونمثل فلسطين رحت هناك في الحدود طلعت من باب من دارنا في زي الرياضة في دراجتي طلعت فيها في كل سلمية من جهتنا كنت واقف أبعد عن حدود تقريبا من 250 متر إلى 300 متر تم استهداف قدم اليمنى في طرق نار متفجر تم العمليات دخلت كانوا صعبات جدا عليا تعبت رجل على آخر قالوا لي راح تأثر على مستقبلك وتأثر على حياتك كافيك هيك تتنفس وعايش وضلق بين أهلك راح نبتر لك قدمك دقيت دقيت كثير ذكرت حلمي وذكرت هدفي اللي أنا بس عورات دقيت يعني مش هرجع أركب الدراجة الاحتلال مش بطر قدمي بطر حلمي بطر هدفي Our hearts go out to that young man as a keen sportsman myself. Uh, must be horrendous what he's going through, but uh, he has to blame his own leadership and that of Hamas rather than blaming uh, Israel for the situation. Um, that was not produced by Hamas, which it could easily have been done, but it was actually produced by Oxfam, who are there to make uh, the life uh, better for Palestinians and Israelis and help to bring about peace and reconciliation on the ground. But it seems that they've completely swallowed the Hamas agenda. Absolutely. I mean, we just look at what she says at the beginning of the film. He talks about how his father used to work in Israel. Well, who stopped that? You know, it's the missiles that they've been throwing over. It's the rockets that they threw over. They drove us out of Gaza. And when we finally left, and they, you know, after killing us, bombing us, everything, we finally left. Then what did they do? 
Hamas comes into power and rules, they are turning Gaza into a terrorist mini-state. They could have turned that area, that Gaza, into a Singapore, and they chose differently. So whose fault is that? Now, I, my, as, as you said, my heart goes out to this young man, but he's blaming the wrong people. He personally has swallowed the lies of Hamas, hook, line, and sinker, has nothing to do with the occupation, the so-called occupation. We're not there. How can we be occupying? Absolutely. It has to do with perhaps Hamas's occupation of Gaza. Maybe that's what he's talking about. But what's more troubling is the fact that these uh, NGOs who are there to make a difference on the ground are taking very, very strong political positions. I mean, we're not talking about one of supporting the Palestinian Authority, but this is one of actually supporting Hamas and not putting any of uh, that report in its actual context, that Absolutely. here is a terrorist organisation uh, that is... Um, persecuting Christians, persecuting anyone who dares speak up against Hamas, uh, even attacks and kills people for having weddings because they're actually singing, um, and just bringing nothing but poverty and uh, tyranny and fear amongst the population of Gaza. And I want to see Gaza free, but free of Hamas. Absolutely. And you know what? The worst organization in this context is uh, the UNRWA, the United Nations um, organization that takes care of the refugee, the so-called refugees. This is a UN-sponsored organization that is completely cozying up with Hamas and the most radical elements uh, of uh, um, Palestinian society. Their facilities have been used regularly as um, areas for, for weapons and for or launching pads for the missiles coming in schools that are owned by UNRWA. And uh, I'm very excited that the United States has decided to withdraw from the Human Rights Council. The next step has to be cutting off all funding for UNRWA. Once they're out of the picture, there will be really a possibility to get things going, I believe, because they are artificially um, sustaining this situation through UN money. But why is there such silence when it comes to these uh, very powerful, very influential non-governmental organisations known as NGOs and the fact that they are silent when it comes to the horrendous uh, human rights abuses received by anyone who is there uh, criticise Mohammed uh, Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, sorry, of the Palestinian Authority. And if they dare say anything against Hamas, they're dead. These organizations, it has become a self-sustaining uh, agenda, really, because these organizations employ Palestinians, they employ workers from all over the world, they are funding themselves by feeding into this hatred. They stop that, their organizations die. I don't even know how much they care about the Palestinians or they don't care about the Palestinians, but what they clearly care about is maintaining their organizations. And I think this is what we're seeing. Absolutely. And also uh, what happened this week is uh, tremendous news that uh, the United States has pulled out of the United Nations uh, Human Rights Council over constant, constant attack on Israel. So let's have a look at uh, this uh, press briefing, um, actually in the State Department with uh, Pompeo, Secretary of State, and also Nikki Haley, America's ambassador to the United Nations. Good afternoon. The Trump administration is committed to protecting and promoting the God-given dignity and freedom of every human being. Every individual has rights that are inherent and inviolable. They're given by God and not by government. Because of that, no government must take them away. For decades, the United States has led global, global efforts to promote human rights, often through multilateral institutions. While we have seen improvements in certain human rights situations, for far too long we have waited while that progress comes too slowly, or in some cases, never comes. Too many commitments have gone unfulfilled. President Trump wants to move the ball forward. From day one, he has called out institutions or countries who say one thing and do another. And that's precisely the problem at the Human Rights Council. As President Trump said at the UN General Assembly, it is a massive source of embarrassment to the United Nations that some governments with egregious human rights records sit on the Human Rights Council. 
We have no doubt that there was once a noble vision for this council. But today we need to be honest. The Human Rights Council is a poor defender of human rights. Worse than that, the Human Rights Council has become an exercise in shameless hypocrisy with many of the world's worst human rights abuses going ignored and some of the world's most serious offenders sitting on the council itself. The only thing worse than a council that does almost nothing to protect human rights is a council that covers for human rights abu abuses and is therefore an obstacle to progress and an impediment to change. The Human Rights Council enables abuses by absolving wrongdoers through silence and falsely condemning those who have committed no offense. A mere look around the world today demonstrates that the Council has failed in its stated objectives. Its membership includes authoritarian governments with unambiguous and abhorrent human rights records, such as China, Cuba, and Venezuela. There is no fair or competitive election process, and countries have colluded with one another to undermine the current method of selecting members. And the Council's continued and well-documented bias against Israel is unconscionable. Since its creation, the Council has adopted more resolutions condemning Israel than against the rest of the world combined. The United States has no opposition in principle to multilateral bodies working to protect human rights. We desire to work with our allies and partners on this critical objective that reflects America's commitment to freedom. But when organizations undermine our national interests and our allies, we will not be complicit. When they seek to infringe on our national sovereignty, we will not be silent. The United States, which leads the world in humanitarian assistance, and whose service members have sacrificed life and limb to free millions from oppression and tyranny, will not take lectures from hypocritical bodies and institutions as America selflessly give their blood and treasure to help the defenseless. Ambassador Haley has spent more than a year trying to reform the Human Rights Council. She is the right leader to drive our efforts in this regard at the United Nations. Her efforts in this regard have been tireless. She has asserted American leadership on everything from Assad's, the Assad regime's chemical weapons use to the pressure campaign against North Korea and the Iran-backed propagations in the Middle East. Ambassador Haley has been fearless and a consistent voice on behalf of our ally Israel, and she has a sincere passion to protect the security, dignity, and the freedom of human beings around the world, all while putting American interests first. She has been a fierce defender of human rights. Chile are living uh, in historic times, so all I can say is God bless uh, the current uh, US administration. Uh, that must make you smile, that, that the fact that Israel has been condemned by the United Nations and we have a woman like Nikki Haley, who's America's ambassador to the United Nations, literally standing up for Israel when no one else did. Um, and I think we have a future U.S. president in the making there. She is amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, Sonja, we're coming down towards, towards the end of the program. And um, personally, I want to say it's always a pleasure to have you as my guest on this program. And, and I think you are a, a fantastic spokeswoman on behalf of the Jewish communities uh, in Judea and Samaria. And you represent the biblical heartland of Israel as a nation, uh, really the heart of Israel. Um, how can our viewers um, get involved and support the very, very important work that you're doing in uh, defending your communities who are <laughs> without, uh, probably the best way to describe this is facing nothing but hostility um, from terrorism who want to destroy your communities to the fact that the international community um, is against you. But as Christians, we're standing with you. Well, first of all, the work we're doing at Christian Friends of Israeli Communities is not just about uh, advocating for the existence of these communities, but helping the people who live there. Uh, we work with children with special needs. We help communities um, uh, acquire vital surveillance cameras or, the, or other uh, emergency equipment, ambulances and ambulance equipment, um, working with the uh, elderly um, and, and the needy. And, and trying to do whatever we can to make life in Judea and Samaria easier, easier and safer. And thanks to Christians from all over the world, we are able to do that. And so to me, Christian Friends of Israeli Communities brings these two amazing needs together. On the one hand, we are reaching out to Christians who uh, would or can support the Jewish communities and, and 
and excuse me, encouraging them to raise their voices so that we have political leaders who might be listening to what those voices are saying and influence the way Israel is treated on the international scene. But maybe even more importantly like that, if you're talking about an ordinary person, what can you do? What can anybody do? Get online, donate, give money. Give money to help that child who lives in Gush Etzion and who has Down syndrome and is going to a special program that doesn't get all the help it needs from the government, needs a little bit of extra help. Give money to the community of Rechelim, where we've recently installed surveillance cameras, and we need to install more because it's a very small community completely surrounded by hostile villages, where Arabs have tried in the past to infiltrate the community, where they've even tried to set fire to one of the caravans in the community. And thank God, because of equipment we've uh, provided to them, we have been able to protect these people. The needs are endless. The thanks to Christians who love Israel and who want to make a difference, not only standing up and saying, I believe that the Jews have a right to live in Judea and Samaria, and that's very important, but by supporting our work, you're also supporting the people who actually live there, make our lives easier, safer. We need you, we need your help, and I hope everybody watching this program today will get online at cfoic.com and donate. Fantastic. And the other thing is to actually visit your communities. Um, I mean, um, you know, they're, they're, they're fabulous. I mean, if, if you've got a choice of living in a flat or Tel Aviv or living in one of your communities in a big house, uh, I think I know I'd choose. Absolutely. And, you know, again, on our website too, just send me an email. Anybody who says, I want to come and visit, we help you. We inv I'll invite anybody to come and visit me in my community in Karnei Shomron. We have people coming through every day from around the world. And of course, if you're part of a tour group, connect with us and we'll help turn your time in Israel into something extra special by spending time in Judea and Samaria. Fantastic. Um, Sonja, I thank you so much for being my guest on the Middle East Report and uh, this time next year, yeah? Absolutely. And uh, I just want to thank you for watching today's uh, Middle East Report. And it's so important that uh, we support the uh, Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria living in the uh, biblical heartland of Israel. We know the international community is against them, but as Christians, we're not. So we've got to continue to support this very important and uh, precious Jewish community who are filling their biblical commands to set up communities in the heartland of Israel. And so we'll leave you with this uh, inspiring song dedicated to the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Extol him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness has overcome us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples, for his merciful kindness has overcome truth of the Lord endures forever. 
Yeah. 